for criminal media's policy, this is Sane Lamini. Joining me today is former journalist and author Brian Rostron to discuss his latest book titled Lost on the Map. So this book details your family's colonial legacy all the way to the present as South Africa. Can you now tell us why you decided to write this book about your family's dubious legacy and how were you able to get such information? It was a gradual process, and as I hope the reader will find, that along with me, it it was a process of of discovery. I had no idea um, uh, 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 of this. I mean, as in my, I'm an only child, and when I was small, my family background really ended with my grandmother, Trixie, in Johannesburg. And beyond that, I, I didn't know anything. There was just one strange family myth. Uh, that an ancestor, Captain Samuel Wallace, was the first European to land in Tahiti in 1767. And the family myth was that he was eaten (laughs) by uh, the Queen of Tahiti. And that absurdly, one of these colonial myths, that that made the relatives and the inheritors of the person who had been eaten part of the Tahitian royal family. Well, that was complete, you know, it's just one of those absurd colonial myths. Mm. Um, And many years later, I mean, I just accepted, I didn't think about it, but uh, 27 or so years ago, I thought, hang on, I'll look it up. And Captain Samuel Wallace was indeed a distant relative, but he certainly wasn't (laughs) eaten at all. He died uh, in a distinguished old age back in England, Uh, many, many years after his voyage to Tahiti. So I thought, well, that's interesting. Here's a good example of what happens when uh, people land on a distant shore with people they know nothing about uh, and how myths develop. And in fact, as I investigated, the actual story was far more interesting, uh, if I may (laughs) say. What actually happened was that in Tahiti, there was no iron. So the sailors on HMS Dolphin began pulling out all the nails and exchanging them for sex with Tahitian maidens to the point where the ship began falling apart, literally. And the captain, my ancient uh, ancestor, Captain Wallace, had to read the emergency legislation of in- usually used in time of war. And I thought, well, here's a beginning of a really interesting story of how myths Develop, but the, the actual process of, of it was a long process. That was way back 27 years ago before I returned to South Africa, which was nearly 25 years ago, that I began looking into some of uh, what I thought might be the, the family uh, past. And the more I looked into it, uh, mm-hmm. there was a whole map of relatives I knew nothing about, which for 250 years had gone all over the world, uh, landing on foreign shores about which they knew little and and feeling that they could settle there irrespective of who already lived there. And I thought, well, that's a theme about uh, the effect of colonialism told through my own personal story. So, Brian, the book also tells us about your grandfathers who were racist. It must have been hard discovering such information. Tell us about their involvement during the apartheid era. That was the the other thing that I had in the back of my mind, but I didn't know quite how to develop it, was that my two grandfathers, I didn't know either of them, one on my mother's side, one on my father's side, they both arrived shortly after the Anglo-Boer War, uh, mm-hmm. And one grandfather became the second editor of the Sunday Times in 1907. And in the lead up to the Act of Union, where the big debate was, would the Cape franchise, which allowed uh, what are called, which in part terms are called colored people, uh, to mm-hmm. vote based on an education and property franchise. And as I looked into the old editorials in 1909, 1910, I discovered that my, my grandfather much to my huge discomfort, uh, was a racist. He used terms which, you know, I wouldn't even repeat (laughs) now. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. Here's a way of personally trying to come to terms 
with my own South African legacy. Mm. And the other interesting thing was uh, the later he became editor of the Rond Daily Mail from uh, 1924 to 1941, when it was actually the voice of the Randlord. So he, was a, he became a very establishment figure. My other grandfather, however, was a working class printer uh, who was a trades unionist. And he printed all the early pamphlets and the newsletter and the paper for the early South African Communist Party. And I thought, well, that's an interesting way of looking at two sides of our history. Mm. But as I look more and more into it, of course, you know, it came down further, uh, further than that, my parents, and then, of course, my, my own experiences. So I thought, here's trying to fit in to, to my South African family experience, but to fit it into a greater picture of over 250 years of the spread of colonialism. And when you talk about now your grandfather arriving in Jobek, which was a bit interesting for me, the way he described the city then was in a way accurate. If you look at the city now, did you also get yes. that impression when you read that description? Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it's not just that. My father, uh, Frank Rostron, who was quite a famous uh, sports writer, uh, he was a young uh, reporter on The Star, as it was in those days, in the 20s and early 30s. And I remember him telling me, you know, it was a, a, it was a gold rush city, Wild West. He said, you know, one day uh, a, a man would be rich and the next day you'd find that, you know, the police were after him. Buildings would go up and the next day they'd come down. Money was being made, money was being lost. Uh, so I thought, gosh, you know, this is, this is Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, the, the, the point, it, it, not only, I mean, this isn't a doer history. This is told from my exploration of my family point of view. There's quite a lot of humor in it because, of course, some, some of these things were utterly absurd. Your father also managed now uh, the 1936 South African boxing team uh, at the Berlin Olympics. And one of those uh, boxers was recruited by the Nazis. Tell us about that. Yes, well, that was an extraordinary coincidence. My father, uh, who'd been a considerable athlete uh, and a, a boxer himself, a South African boxing champion. And when he left South Africa, he'd covered the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles as a 23-year-old. Uh, and so the star sent him in 1936 to cover the, the Nazi Olympics in Berlin. And because he was a boxer and respected by boxers, he was also asked to manage the South African boxing team. And their star performer was a boxer called Roby Liebrandt, who was an extreme Afrikaner nationalist, a zealot and a fanatic. And at one point, while they were in Berlin, my father couldn't understand why the Nazis were kind of falling over themselves to, to ingratiate themselves with the boxing team. And he got a letter from a very high-ranking a uh, Nazi uh, official called Liebrandt, who said, oh, I wonder if you could introduce me to one of your team. I think he might be a long lost relative. Well, of course he wasn't. Herr Liebrandt, in fact, was so senior that he was one of the 15 people later at the Wannasee Conference, which decided on the final solution and the extermination of the Jews. That's how senior he was. And in fact, what the plan was to recruit Roby Liebrandt uh, into the Nazi cause, uh, and later, which they did, and later in 1941, he was taken off the coast of uh, Namaqualand and landed on the coast uh, to try to begin uh, a sabotage campaign uh, uh, with the aim of recruiting uh, Af mostly Afrikaner nationalists who were, who were against the Smuts government and the involvement of South Africa in the Second World War to try and uh, overthrow the Smuts government uh, assassinate Smuts and change sides, as it were, and join with the Nazis. And he was quite successful. He, he recruited quite a, a lot of people, but in the end, he was caught. Uh, and by an extraordinary coincidence, uh, at that point, my father was a war correspondent for the London Daily Express, and they'd sent him back to South Africa, just at the time when Roby Liebrandt was on trial. So my father uh, was actually in the court as Liebrandt was being tried, and Liebrandt, of course, recognised him. Uh, but my father said it was, it was so sad. He, when he was condemned to death, he gave the Nazi salute and shouted, I greet death. I mean, he was a fanatic, you know, and it's so interesting that he, his death penalty was commuted by 
uh, the then Prime Minister, Jan Smuts, because Rie Brent's father had been a very brave member of Smuts' commando during the anglo boer War. So his, his sen death sentence was commuted. But then, in 1948, when the Nationalist Party gained power, one of the first things they did was to release Roby Liebrandt. So it's quite an interesting and quite a dramatic part of South African history to which my father was, you know, the absolute direct witness. And tell us about how your father resisted um, to be influenced in a way uh, to think uh, like other white um, people at the time during the apartheid uh, era. Because I believe he was given books uh, that were meant to shape him in, in a certain direction, but he resisted. What did you think of his character? He had traveled, obviously, the Berlin Olympics, and then he went to London in 1937 to join the London Daily Express, where, incidentally, the, the, one of his first assignments as a young reporter was mm -hmm. to, to have an exhibition, a boxing bout, with the former world heavyweight champion, Primo Carnera. Uh, so he was well-traveled. He hated apartheid, but he was quite conservative. He was more uh, in the United Party, smuts more believing gradualism and so on. So for me, um, the interesting thing was he never told me about his own father, the working class printer, and his involvement with the trades unions, with the 1922 Rand insurrection and printing all the newspapers for the early Communist Party. He, he never told me about that. In fact, what he told me was that his father, they were quite poor when he was young, his father lost all the housekeeping money at the horse races. But in fact, what I discovered in my researches is that William Roston, or Bill Roston, he was known to his fellow trades unionists, was owed a lot of money in the 20s by the early Communist Party because they couldn't afford to pay him properly for his work. And he eventually inherited their printing press. Why had my father never talked about his father? Ne he must have known you know, when I was, you know, in my late teens and so on, that I, I was very involved politically and so on. Why did he never tell me that? And so there are two possibilities, and these are the interesting things rather than coming to a judgment, is either he was embarrassed, uh, being relatively conservative, uh, mm -hmm. and having made a, a career, of, a, a quite a distinguished career for himself, first as a war correspondent, then later after the war, as quite a famous um, sports writer, maybe he was a bit embarrassed about, or did he think that if uh, he encouraged me to look into that grandfather, that as a young man in South Africa, when apartheid was at its height, that perhaps uh, he, would, he, he would only encourage my, my sort of anger uh, at the injustice of the system. So it's intriguing to think, well, what, what was the motive? And is there anything that you would like to share um, with our viewers that also came as a shock as you discovered information about your family? One of the you know, things that not having known anything beyond my grandmother in Johannesburg was mm -hmm. that not only uh, had uh, Samuel Wallace, uh, the ancestor who had uh, uh, the first European to arrive in Tahiti, uh, which in the 18th century began the idea, which was very common among the European philosophers, of uh, the noble savage, as it were, as opposed to the over-civilized West, Western. So that was one area interesting to explore. The other was that I discovered that another ancestor was the carpenter on the second great voyage of discovery by Captain James Cook. And in this small wooden boat, we were among the first Europeans to penetrate the Arctic Circle. Then I discovered that Later, in the 1830s, four brothers, who were all carpenters from the sh naval shipyard in Kent, all emigrated to Australia because they had very little, in the very stultified, class-ridden society of England, they, they could see no future for themselves. So they all emigrated to Sydney in Australia. And um, one in particular, my great-great-grandfather, uh, William Wallace, arrived. He was a carpenter and began as an undertaker. But within 20 years, he was one of the richest men in Australia. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, again, another way of, of looking at what the attitudes were at the time. How did he do it? And then, fascinatingly, uh, and he was very rich, um, uh, his son lost the lot. Uh, <laughs> and so looking into how you know, the ups, their downs, uh, some of it is sad, 
Um, some of it's uh, terribly funny. I mean, the other aspect which, which really intrigued me when I was young was when I, I think I was 16, uh, my mother and I visited my uncle René, who was married to Auntie Betty, and they lived on a small cottage on a, a small holding uh, just outside Cape Town. Uh, and um, one morning I woke up and looked out the window um, and it was on a, a battery chicken farm. This is when I was 16. And I saw Uncle Rennie standing outside in this tiny little garden, dressed in his uh, best suit, raising the fan of Monte Carlo and saluting it because somehow he had made himself the honorary consul for Monaco. The, the tiny little principality on the Mediterranean, mostly famous for, for the casino. And I, I was looking at him and think, even at 16, I thought, he, he lives in South Africa, but actually his mental universe is 6,000 miles ago, away, where he imagines you know, people are more elegant, more cultivated. And I, and I remember thinking exactly this, what on earth do we white people think we're doing in Africa? So that was really what I tried, rather than straight history, try to get into what were all these people from Tahiti to Australia uh, to South Africa, what, over 250 years, what did they think they were doing? What was in their minds? What did they achieve? Uh, and to me, that's um, a fascinating question. And often in those cases, myths uh, or the family myths um, are more interesting than the actual facts because they tell us what people thought of themselves, how they saw themselves, perhaps as opposed to the actual reality. And I thought, well, there's a really interesting way of trying to trace through my own family and my own personal reaction to it, not only the history of empire, but more specifically, how that affected South Africa right up to the present day. So the book also got me thinking that uh, some families uh, might also want to find more information about their families and where they come from. Was this an easy exercise? It took me 27 years <laughs> from when I began. But, but, but you know, obviously I was uh, w working as a journalist. And mm -hmm. since then, I've also written six other books. But I was very dogged because the more I dug, and it wasn't easy, a lot of it wasn't easy, but the more I dug, uh, a lot of information is there. You just have to know where to look for it. And so I think... What uh, perhaps the, the book might make people think, you know, who, who, like when I was younger, you just accepted stories and you thought, oh, well, here we are. You don't really think how we got here and your mother tells you something and your dad tells you a, a little snippet. It's really interesting to think, how did we get here? The interesting thing in a way in this age of, uh, of, of um, xenophobia, including South Africa and much of Europe, is that until 1914, you didn't need a passport to travel. So all these relatives, including my two sets of grandparents who arrived just after the Anglo-Global War, all they had to do was have enough fare to go cheap class on a boat. They didn't need a passport. So they just got on a boat and went wherever it took them, or took their fancy to go in the world. So when you look at the figures of the number of British people who immigrated to the United States, to Australia, to South Africa, to Canada, we're talking many, many, many millions. And so when you hear people in England now objecting to immigrants, mostly whom are uh, fleeing from wars caused by the confusions uh, caused by uh, not only just the British Empire, the French Empire, but this is the, the backwash, as it were, of empire. And it's a minuscule number compared to the number of English people who, who, who emigrated uh, at the beginning of the century. So I think that I, I like to see these things in, in that kind of perspective. And lastly, how did you feel about uncovering uh, the truth about your forefathers? And would you say, it has changed any aspect of your life now. It made me really think about you know, the effect of it. You, I knew a lot about, I, I read a lot of history, I knew a lot about empire. But when you look at your, at your family and you think, how did they do it? How easy it was for them? What did they think they were doing? You begin to reflect on your own inheritance. And I think it should make people of my heritage, as it were, 
a little bit more modest uh, uh, when you hear people complaining. Anybody whose grandparents arrived in the 20th century uh, from Europe had a stroke of luck. And we've accumulated a lot of inheritance from that. Knowledge, education, a lot of material benefits. Uh, and you think, well, what was the price that other people were paying? And so I, I think it just, it, it's just so interesting to not just to look at it in the abstract, but in a very, very personal way uh, and see what your own family uh, has contributed. And it's fascinating. As I say, some of it's interesting. Some were scoundrels. Some were very brave. And some of this is incredibly funny. Uh, I mean, I, I, my mother died uh, uh, in 2004, and I often think, oh, gosh, when I decide, I wish I could tell her that, she'd fall about laughing. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's, it's an, a fascinating enterprise, a wonderful journey to take, uh, even if sometimes it's uncomfortable, uh, as I found with my grandfather, who was writing all these embarrassingly racist uh, editorials in the Sunday early Sunday Times in Johannesburg. And some of it just may, helps you reflect on how we got to be here. And that, I think that always helps. There was Brian Rostron in conversation with Polity about his latest book titled, Lost on the Map. 